Okay, so they're both recording. Okay. And it's recording audio as well. So all right. feel free to start. Okay. So how do you identify as a sensitive, as a medium, or how do you um well to some people I'm the world's weirdest historian <laughs> and other I'm a I say I'm an extra large medium. <laughs> but I'm also I really am a life coach. I okay. do readings and, and um so, and there's a lot of uh, discussion on the difference between a psychic and a medium, and are they the same thing? <laughs> and um, what's the difference? And, you know, if you get really into trying to define it, nobody really knows for sure. But basically, the current definition is that a psychic is somebody who's sensitive to um, invisible or um, forces, energies, and stuff that mm -hmm. surround them. Um, and a medium is somebody who actually communicates with uh, what they call deceased spirits, although the spirits I talked to aren't necessarily deceased. <laughs> I mean, they weren't, they weren't necessarily physical at the time. Oh, yeah, okay. they haven't been physical, so. So when did you discover that you had this ability? Well, the, the thing, as far as I back as I can remember things happening was in high school, and I discovered that there was... Um, I'd just be listening to somebody complain about being stood up or their parents grounding them for no reason. And um, I didn't have much sympathy, <laughs> which I hope most high school girls don't. You know, it's like, well, they dumped you. I'm just hoping you'll give me a call. <laughs> but I found that if I was just uh, kind of just observing and just attentive and didn't really get involved in the conversation, sometimes all of a sudden I'd see this vision in my head and it was like a TV show. It's just a scenario. And I could see it wasn't necessarily the guy, I don't think, because I didn't always know what they looked like. Mm -hmm. But I could start telling them, you know, why he dumped you or why he didn't show up last night or why your what your parents thought really happened. Uh, and it would just play out. And it, the more it came true and the more mm -hmm. I started trying to get excited to see if it's gonna happen when somebody was talking. Uh, and uh, then, you know, my social life kind of took over, and um, and so I put kind of put it aside. And then um, I couldn't tell you where the connection was when I, between, well, part of it was after high school, I traveled with a group called Up With People. Okay. It's a singing group. And um, they were backed by, a, the organization was a very religious organization, and they, what they did, had was, in the practice was they did what they call guidance, and we call it meditation now. Okay. And they would sit down before they did any activity, whether it was a show they were putting on or an interview, mm -hmm. and they'd sit down and spend 15 minutes and just wait to see. They'd ask questions, you know, where do we go, who do we contact, and they would just wait to see what came. And uh, the belief was that whatever the divine intelligence was that created this universe is like kind of like the guy who created baseball you know everything was already in place right there were you had to have rules to keep people from killing each other but the create animals and us and everything it was already a kind of a plan going on and so they said instead of praying for something to happen or not happen they would just sit and quiet and wait for instructions on where do I go now where what are we mm -hmm. supposed to do and it became really amazing when I first started I just sat there looking and I'd write down in my notebook something so they'd think I was <laughs> doing something and I found that and now they call I found out it's called automatic writing and uh, I found it by just put the question down there and kind of played around pretty soon I started getting uh, what call we call transmissions or a narrative and um, so I used that method for quite a while and um, did amazing things when we were traveling with the the um, show because I was in charge with two other people that were getting food for out of California for for a conference in New York on an island off the coast of New Rochelle, and we were like 19, 18, and 20, the three women, and they sent us to California and said, "Go find food for these people," and so we have guidance every morning, and it told us to go to Hertz rent a car, and even said go to the Hertz people in San Francisco and. Um, that one stop there, got his cars all the way up and down the coast free of charge, and uh, wow. 
we ended up with box car loads of tomatoes and train car loads of potatoes just by asking the question, okay, we're here, why are we here? And uh, so then I also used it in my personal life, you yeah. know, I'd say, what, should I do this, should I go there? Um, then I came back, um, got married, and um, had kids and children and foster children, and um, there was one time when I was pregnant with the fourth one, and um, uh, I, the other two, I, you know, I'd had kids, children before, and it followed the normal kind of pattern. But this one, for some reason, I didn't expect it. And uh, then about the fourth, fifth month, I was always into names. I loved it, coming up with different names. About the fifth month, I remember waking up in the middle of the night, walking out in the kitchen just as the sun came up, and in the sky was, <laughs> was this name, D-E-V-O-N-Y. And I went back and woke my husband up, and I said, it's a girl, and we're supposed to call her Devony. And uh, it's turned out that she's been the one. I ha we had her at home. No problem. It was a miracle kind of thing. And um, so then I started relying on it even more, mm -hmm. because when, when I found out I was pregnant, I already had a three-month-old, and I just was really upset. You know, why'd life do this to me? Da -da. And so what that did was that clarified to me that this was meant to be, you might mm -hmm. say, that... I didn't, and that's really what I tell people about getting more and more psychic. The psychic abilities, I think, are normal sensitivities, but um, it's what we call intuition. And uh, they're involuntary. It's like falling in love or seeing a sunset happen and just catching your eye or uh, somebody says something to you and you go, wow, I never thought of it that way. Right. It's not, it, it's those things that just come to us. And it's, uh, to me, it's the same kind of force that tells the birds when to fly south for the winter and tells that little acorn how to grow to be a 2,000-year-old oak tree. You know, they're natural forces that uh, we are, can be connect to and get the same kind of information. But um, we're pretty proud of ourselves for having this wonderful brain up here that kind of... <laughs> so anyway, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> Uh, well, the one other thing, okay, the one other thing was, um, so I kind of did that, I, uh, I just was kind of going along, working with friends and using it in my own personal life and uh, with trying my kids, and started getting together with a group of other, mostly women, who wanted to uh, know more about the channeling and, you know, that, when that started getting popular. So I just pretty much said, they said, well, you're psychic, well, can you channel? I said, I don't know. But tell me what you do to do it, and we'll see if it happens. And uh, so I just kind of evolved from that. And one night we were, in the uh, late 80s, we were sitting at somebody's house, and at the end of the session, um, a woman who, who'd come, uh, come before was, had been in Arizona, and she brought this envelope over to me, and she said, I wanted you to look at these, and she pulls these sand paintings out of the envelope. And she said, I thought I was, I was meant to show them to you. And I went, hmm, nice sand paintings. <laughs> and uh, she said, I said, no, I'm sorry, I don't get anything off of them. And she went to put them back into the envelope, and I said, wait, Stallone, Stallone, D-S-T-A, S-T-A-L-O-N-E. And that was the name of the artist that painted them. Oh. And one of the newer people said, wow, you made a believer out of me. And I went, me too, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Well, then two days later, one of the women with, were in that called me, and she said, I saw what happened the other night, what you did, and she said, a friend of mine's daughter was just uh, kidnapped at gunpoint in front of her two children, and nobody knows where she is. We haven't seen her in two days. Would you see what you, if you could pick up on anything? And I said, you know, this is way scary. <laughs> but you can't say no. Right. So uh, that is one of the first... Uh, cases I got involved with and basically what I set, did was I sat down on outside in a chair under a tree and took a notebook and just said does anybody have anything is there any kind of information out there whatever and it wrote Laura wheat field and water and then uh, that encouraged me so then I started asking questions and it turned out that she was found in a wheat field uh, and property that belonged to a, a, a couple named Laura and Jack, and um, Laura was tattooed on the guy's arm that killed her. Oh, wow. And um, 
the fact that everything else I'd done up until that point was very emotional, like personal stuff, and mm -hmm. uh, this was just totally, I didn't even watch crime shows. I don't like any of those, NCES or any mm -hmm. of those, so the fact that I was getting information that only the killer knew, and his wife, his accomplice, um, just kind of shot me into the ozone myself. But um, then there was another one shortly after that, and, and uh, then I remember the day somebody called me and said, I saw you on the news. She said, do you do personal readings? And I said, I don't know, what is that? <laughs> tell, me, tell me what that is. <laughs> so that's kind of what it's been, is it's uh, kind of a, like an artist, I guess. You know, yeah. they start paying, and hey, I didn't know I could use that. Um, but that's been one of the most enlightening things. And then one time I had, from that, somebody called and uh, two sisters who thought, whose sister had been killed in a horrible crash in Washington, D.C., and uh, wanted to know if I could give me any information on what happened because nobody was releasing anything. And, and, um, and they told me that he, she'd been hit by a truck and she had flown, that the car had flown, and then as they were talking, I could see this this big panel truck, and they didn't tell me it was a panel, but in my mind I could see this big panel truck running into it, and I knew it was a lone driver, and it was a man, I could see that, and I saw this car flip and flip and flip and then land in the ditch. And uh, so, I, and now I do that regularly. Somebody says, can you do it? Can you give me some insight? I say, you know, these connections go all over, and it'd just be like you calling me and uh, me referring you to Rose and other people in the business that do this kind of thing. Um, it's the same thing happens on these channels. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I now believe that I'll say, you know, let me sleep on it if it isn't something that's got to be done that day. Because if I'm connected, if I can get it, if I'm connected on other points, then I can, get, I can help you. Right. If I'm not, it's like trying to call people you know and nobody's answering because they're, they, <laughs> they're not there. So uh, that, um, in that particular case, that was the first one where I sat down and I got this vision that I thought must have something. So I sat down and the first thing that came, I just said, does anybody have any information? And a lot of times I've had this foreign languages uh, come through and I hear the accent and I know what they're saying. But if I was to channel it or try mm -hmm. to say it, mm -hmm. I can't do that. It comes out English and plain Kansas, Kansas girl, <laughs> Kansas girl language. Um, but it was a uh, an Indian, uh, an Indian man, and he was just. I mean, I couldn't write fast enough. Have him apologizing. I didn't see her. The brakes failed. I mean, he was telling me what had happened, mm -hmm. and he was the driver of the panel truck. And. Um, so I called him back and I said, I didn't get anything about your sister. I probably can, but that shook me up so much to think that, how did that happen? Yeah. How did, uh, you know? Um, but because it was reassuring and, uh, and I wasn't ever afraid of it, I was just in awe and I wanted to make sure that I didn't ever take it lightly. Sure. Um, and then I got to the point when my son died in 1994, I'd already done some like that, some readings for people who had lost somebody. Um, but then uh, when he died, it kind of uh, brought home the fact that more of the ghost and the ghost phenomenon was starting out more here uh, again. And um, so I was just decided that this would, not only was I into the history, mm -hmm. but I thought this would be a kind of engaging, entertaining, and enlightening way. I didn't do it for anybody else's sake, I just wanted to experience it myself. But um, that's what, uh, how I got into doing the tours, the historic okay. tours, yeah. And how long have you been doing the tours? I started Longmont in 2000. Okay. And um, then I, uh, by 2001, 2002, I was doing Loveland and Erie, and I do Erie and Longmont and Loveland and Lyons and Frederick and central, some central city. Oh, wow. Um, and as I did the tours, people started taking the tours, most of them I did more in October because that's when people were looking for ghost stuff and uh, people would take the tour thinking that it was just going to be a ma fabricated stories and that kind of thing and then when they would get so a lot of people when they would take the tours then and realize I really believe this stuff and none of my none of the stories on the tour are fabricated 
they all dovetail into the history uh, in some way. That these mm -hmm. are those are the people that we are talking about. And um, so I was sitting up after the tour till midnight, someplace, feeding questions and listening to experiences. So I also have. Um, <laughs> This is like coming out, let me tell you. <laughs> I've been doing it the last year because ghost, the ghost phenomenon's really, and it's taken a twisted by TV standards and everything. It's, you know, it's taking some bad, going in a bad direction as far as I'm concerned. And um, so I have about, I would say 15 right now, what I call, they call themselves familiars, who are actually living spirits, which is different than a ghost, in my estimation. A living spirit is actually an invisible to us. We're not um, living form that just travels at a different frequency. Right. And that's a whole other segment, so we won't go into that. But anyway, so I said I really wanted to put something together where we could get together with people that and let them talk about their experiences mm -hmm. and tell, share mine, so we could get more of a knowledge of what was maybe what this could be, and uh, like a lab work. And so I sat down in meditation one morning, and I asked my guides and their my familiars. I said, "Okay, this is your group. This is your organization. What do you want to call it?" And uh, I found myself writing "Spooks." S P O O K S. And my left brain went, "Well, oh, that's a good marketing tool." My right brain went, "No, no, no, no. That's too derogatory. I don't like that." But before I had a chance to really get the debate going, it wrote. Society for the Prevention of the Ostracization or Obliteration of Kindred Spirits. And it was after I wrote that I realized it was Spooks. Okay. So it's been a good marketing tool because people say it's sponsored by Spooks. But um, since then now we've gone, we've actually focused more on the Kindred Spirit part of it. Mm -hmm. And we say it's an organization for ghost enthusiasts and enthusiastic ghosts because we do have a lot of, a lot of uh, spirits that are part of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how kindred spirits got going. And we have a saying in, in the group that's there's no such thing as a non-believer. There's just people nothing's happened to yet. <laughs> because whether it's just a tap on the shoulder or cold spot or a funny dream, you, you never forget it. You know, you just don't. Right. Um, so, um, and we do a lot of things. We became a 501c3 in 2003. And... Um, it, um, our mission statement is through personal experiences and um, research and um, investigations and what we call site inspections to try to find out as much as we can mm -hmm. about this invisible life that's going on there and then share it with people, other people who are interested and um, hopefully reduce the fear of death and the fear of the afterlife because anybody who's really interested in the ghost phenomenon wants to know about after mm -hmm. the afterlife. And um, so we, uh, and probably at that point, we were one of the, the only federally exempt paranormal <laughs> organization. Um, and we do all sorts of different things. We just did a dining with the dead in the cemetery. Uh, but the concept isn't that we're, we're actually, the concept is this invisible energy. And um, the way I, I explain it, as I understand it, is that we give off energy. Everybody gives off energy as physical. If we didn't, you wouldn't be able to see each other. We wouldn't be able to take anybody's picture, hang it on the wall. Um, and th those things are invisible, and we accept them all the time. But you can't see the words coming out of my mouth. You know, music's the same way. All of a sudden, you can hear music, mm -hmm. but the music is... And I, people say, so you hear... Voices? You talk to disembodied voices? And I said, yeah, don't you? <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, don't you ever use your telephone? I mean, you pick up the phone and there's this voice on the other end and you have no proof there's any body attached to it. Right. Um, and it, that, it, that energy comes across wires with thousands of other, other voices. And uh, it's like TV. You can watch people playing soccer live in, in Europe. True. And that all that energy comes over. My favorite one is Elvis Presley because um, I have a CD that was that was transferred. My son made it for me from a, uh, an old cassette tape that I recorded off of a radio station that was playing a recording of a live performance of Elvis Presley in 1975. 
Now picture that. You've got this thousands of people out there, maybe 50,000 standing there, looking at a stage, and all of a sudden this man comes out, stands there, and opens his mouth. And out of his mouth comes this energy you can't see, but it has its own little DNA, whatever you want to call it in it, and it goes out through these weird speakers, and it still doesn't get distorted, and goes out and hits the ears of all these 50,000 people. And very few would people who paid to go there would say, that's not him, that's Frank Sinatra. And even that's amazing that they, you know, the, it's the same current, you can't see them, right. but you can tell by what, how it affects you. Right. Um, so that, then they taped it and they probably made thousands of records off of it. So that energy that he put out there that night got somehow attached to these tapes that you can pull apart with your finger. And then it gets attached to this CD, magnetically adheres to the CD that melts in the sun. And now they say he's dead. 55 years later, hey, I can take that CD and I can slip it in that weird little machine that I don't understand. And out comes this energy that's distinctly Elvis Presley's voice. That's, to me, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's the concept of what a ghost is, is a ghost is not... Uh, and if you think about the word haunting, it says it's a haunting metal day. It's something that from the past that you can't get rid of, mm -hmm. or he keeps haunting me, or they keep, you know, uh, uh, something in that book haunted me. And so a haunted house or a haunted building, my perception is that it's something that has energies and has things from the past that affect us, and mm -hmm. usually affect us emotionally because it's not just a news report. Right. You know, it's been some kind of personal emotional experience that's happened to somebody that these energies are giving off and um, so it's energy that like on the tape recorder or like on the video uh, get trapped or magnetically get imprinted onto uh, in places and uh, we can pick them up on our machines uh, we can pick them up a lot of people can you can hear them you can sometimes you see them if the, co the conditions right and they do like a video. If we took a video of this, which you're doing, uh, tomorrow we'll all be wearing different clothes, doing different things. But you can duplicate that over and over and over again. And when people look at it, it looks just like we're doing it now. Right. And that's part of what we're doing about trying to dispel the, the, the fear of the, of the ghost. And some people get disappointed when they take my ghost tour and find out that... <laughs> They're not gonna, it's not going to be anybody that had an axe in their put in their head and, you know, a zombie kind of thing. Uh, but these are my forefathers and my, the history makers that created this wonderful life I enjoy today, so I'm not about to put them down. But, but Sam, it's like a movie. You know, if you're watching a movie and you see Clint Eastwood shooting all these people, uh, you might cover your eyes like I would because you don't want to see all the blood and, and the horror. But nobody expects that he's going to come off that movie screen and come out in the audience and do the same thing to him if they right. if they boo him or anything. He's because he's long gone. What's on that movie screen is that energy that he put out there, and uh, and it's so they you can also see scenarios. If somebody says, "Well, I've been seeing this man," and the, the, one of the ghosts we talk about in here, um, that that's there. It's residual energy, but it's actually in a. Uh, time warp because he does the same thing at the same time looks right. the same so it's like a recording and uh, the energy just keeps going um, and you don't always the whole thing doesn't stay mm -hmm. but if you get a glimpse of something uh, like this this man has a gray suit so once you tell somebody that maybe somebody saw some energy what they thought might have been just dust flying or whatever right. but if it had a great gray tint to it then they relax a little bit more, and then you, your mind fills in the, the blanks. Um, and people say, well, you know, you can see apparitions and stuff because you're psychic, but it's exactly the same concept as dreaming. You know, that's, yeah. to me, dreaming is one of your psychic senses because it's an unconscious thing, but you can talk to people. I sing in mine because I'm a karaoke <laughs> buff. Uh, <laughs> you can... Um, you know, listen to people. You can be in the third person and watch what's going on, or you can be interactive with it. And then you wake up, and where is all that? Right. Where is that whole last Christmas when you got the present you've been waiting for, and you can visualize it again? Um, so the same same kind of concept is that, uh, and 
that's why the, all the stories dovetail into the history. Right. Not that they have to, there are yeah. other ghosts, that, but that's what I like about it because I'm very, uh, I just think what they went through to get to create this area, the place that I really enjoy, needs to be represented. Mm -hmm. And I picked up stuff, and I tell it on the tour, I picked up information about the history from some of the ghosts that I didn't know before. And uh, so, and that's the same way working on a crime scene or mm -hmm. some crime is if you're able to pick up on that information that's out there, when that man and his wife took that woman and killed her, all that information was just as alive as if they put it on the newspaper. You know, it was yeah. out there, it had happened, it really gone and so all that energy and, and it's out there. So how, why I received it, I think ha happened to do with all the sequence of what we would call coincidences of the lady who came to that for, thing for the first time. Maybe right. somebody said, come on, and she said, okay, I'll try it. And then she gets there and then the next, that she goes home and the next day this happens. Yeah, so that's why I call the underground current. <laughs> you can't see it, but it's no different than, like I said, the TV show. You know, I've got 800 and some channels. They all come in on the back of this, my set <laughs> in this one one cord. And uh, I turn on the TV. I don't. I want to watch Dancing with the Stars, but I know that that may not be what comes on. Right. So that's how we talk about when you do investigations or you is to remain open and. Uh, rather than have, because if you see something and you go, oh my God, did you see that? You think, are you see, all of a sudden your conscious mind is just as busy as if it's making right. supper or communicating. And so you don't feel those things. You don't right. pick up on them. And so I just say, you know, just make your mind blank, like you're looking at a TV screen or a movie screen and you're waiting for the, the, the movie to come on and then mm -hmm. wait to see what shows up. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't like it, Leave. <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> so, oh, it's like talking about my like my grandkids. So you're gonna have to <laughs> no, tell me when to fine. shut up if you have any more questions. <laughs> so, <have laughs> runaway train. Have you had anybody on a tour have an experience? Uh, yes. Um, I always warn them that just because they're here to see something or not. <laughs> doesn't mean they're going to come out and entertain us because, right. you know, they, uh, it's not like a planned show. But um, a lot of people, it's such new to them because, like I said, they, they, it's not, not a lack of knowledge. It's just expectation. Most mm -hmm. of them come thinking they're going to be hearing, you know, seeing fake blood and that kind of thing. Right. Um, but we have a lot of people that now have gone on it that actually bring equipment or... Uh, their camera or whatever, uh, I keep saying whatever, uh, camera and just ready, but it's so engaging when you're talking about these and they're asking questions and they're looking in the building to see what they can see that a lot of times people don't even think, I'll say, if you have your camera, get your camera out. But the most significant one was um, the barber shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I started doing the tours, what I did was go around to the these historic buildings that really caught my eye, like this one. And I got the history, and then I'd go to the people that were living in them or working in them and saying, do you have any stories? And um, I didn't really expect to run into spirits, but I ran into hobos, I ran into, and that was one of those ideas. He didn't actually come to me, but I was able to see him. So I was walking, taking pictures of all these buildings, and uh, got home one day and I'd taken three in succession in the front of the barber shop and uh, when I got the pictures back there, there was this filmy thing coming out of the back room and then the next frame showed this film with filmy thing with more of a shape to it mm -hmm. between the two barber chairs and the third frame the, the energy covered up the whole front window and um, so I would show people on the tour and that's probably the one place where most people more people have gotten uh, visions and actually seen have actually gotten that okay. that anomaly. So I um, show people, tell them about it. And one time, in about 2007, I had about 18 people with me. And there was a minister and his wife and some kids from the youth group. And then there was a, a couple people from the school board. I was just telling you that, so you know these are upstanding citizens. You know <laughs> these aren't. Are, and uh, so we, I told them the story. They, we 
past the, the barber shop, we walk across the street, and I turn around, and there's only about five people in my group. And I look up and see them all over at the barber shop taking pictures, and one guy's got his video camera going. And about that time, they started running, these dignified adults running across the street going, we saw him, we saw him, we saw him, we saw him. <laughs> and uh, the ones that could talk. <laughs> but they all conceded that they'd seen this man between those two bar barber shops, mm -hmm. those two chairs, and he was a little under six foot, and he kind of balding, and he had nice eyes, and he had this apron on with uh, some utensils tucked mm -hmm. in the pocket. And um, so I went gingerly into the barber shop a couple days later. I hadn't gone in and told them what I was doing. And uh, the barber, the head barber then was in his late 80s, and he was first, and I thought, oh, he's not going to want to hear what I have to say. So I walked right on by him, went to one of the younger guys in the back, and I just said, you know, I do these tours, and last night, and I showed him the picture. I said, last night, some people swore they saw the barber, this guy standing between the two chairs. And the guy up front said, oh, yeah, that's Shorty. <laughs> He said he retired a few years ago and we couldn't keep him out of here and then he died a couple years ago and we still can't keep him out of here. That's his picture right on the wall and there's his picture on the oh, wall. Wow. Um, so and he was actually connected with the barber shop and a lot of people know him and and so that that was one of the exciting experiences. Yeah. One of the more intense ones was the church down on 4th Avenue, 4th uh, in Maine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went in there, and there was an art gallery in the early, uh, like 2004, 2005. Barbara Stone had her artwork in there. And she called me one day and asked if I would come in, and, and she said, people that come in that know, are sensitive, tell me that there's something really sad or melancholy going mm -hmm. up in the front of the church. So she said, would you come in and see if you can pick up anything? So I took a couple of people with me who do, you have equipment. And uh, when I feel something, I put a blindfold on because, like dreaming again, mm -hmm. then I, my mind and eyes don't quite a, try to coordinate everything uh, with my, with my uh, computer brain. And uh, I can keep my eyes open and still see without mm -hmm. trying to physically keep my eyes shut. Right. right. So anyway, I got up there and the, the, the beaters were going off around this area. And so I backed off and put my blindfold on and... And what I could see was this, uh, what was it? Uh, <laughs> baptismal. <Okay. laughs> and um, there were people, and when you, when you see back in there something that's happened over and over and over again in the mm -hmm. same spot, sometimes if it's one person, you'll get a video. In this case, you saw people standing on top of each other, kind of like double exposure. Uh -huh. You could see these people standing around the baptismal. And, but I could see that at that point I was seeing them want babies baby or baptizing a baby and I realized that the baby was dead oh. and it really threw threw me out of the trance you might say and and so I we looked back into the history and um, that particular church was the first Episcopal church and they worshiped in a big tent for a long long time because they were trying to build a church and they ran out of money and et cetera, et cetera. So they lost uh, almost a third of their population, a congregation, before they opened, opened the church. And most of them were babies. And they're buried in the Burlington Cemetery okay. out here. But because of their religious beliefs, they, they baptized all the babies before they buried them. Okay. So that was a piece of history that I didn't know. The other thing that happened in that church was when I first walked in the door, I uh, glanced up, up in the corner and there on both sides there's three windows. And then the altar is up front. Mm -hmm. And what I saw over here was an open window, and I saw these things hanging from, or I sensed something over there first. I put my blindfold on. And there was a clothesline that ran from inside the altar area across the open window. And there were th three things hanging from it. It was a black coat, which I called a deacon's coat, a pinafore, doll pinafore, and a child's pinafore hanging upside down on this makeshift clothesline. And so I went to Barbara, and I said, I told her about the baptism thing, and she we talked about that. And then I said, you know, this other thing I saw over here, and I described what I saw. And I said, you know, it makes sense that they didn't have wash machines, so mm -hmm. they washed out these clothes and hung them up there and then took them down, hopefully, before the service. She said, you got to see this picture I have. And she had asked somebody to come in a couple weeks before when they had an art walk or something like that. 
and had them take pictures for publicity. Mm -hmm. And she said when her friend came back with the picture, she said she has this one and she showed me. And she, the woman said her, po her camera went off in her pocket before she, when she was taking it out. So she has all these pictures of the church and all the, the uh, artwork. But here's this one that has a, kind of looks like it was taken through a yellow type of cloth. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's kind of cloudy, but unmistakably over here in the corner of the picture is a black coat and a pinafore hanging in midair. Oh, wow. So that was residual residual energy. Yeah. 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 So, so have you ever, in your time that you've been doing investigations and, and whatnot, have you ever come across anything that's been negative? Well, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the reason I hesitated is my joke is usually I'm more uncomfortable around my ex-husband, but since he since he's basically a really nice man, I don't. But you'll cut that out, right? <laughs> but you know, you can be uncomfortable around people, right. and that that's really what happens. Is if I feel that, then I don't mess with it. You know, right. and I tell people, you know, if you. If I want to meet new new friends, I don't go down to Larimer Street at two o'clock in the morning. Those aren't my my cup of tea. They are people that I could relate to and right. probably wouldn't relate to me very well. Uh, so um, I've never I've never explored that area. Mm -hmm. Got gone gotcha. there, you know. Yeah. Um, but I also have these very like familiars that are just. Um, I, I mean, I just really feel I'm very protected. Right. Um, or that I will get. It's some kind of signal that that's not my best interest right. to do that. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I guess the last question that I have is, do you have a favorite story from your, your ghost tours? Oh, no. I have, too many. Yeah. <laughs> I have too many. I have too many. No, because I think, but that brings up one thing that I like to tell people too is, one of the reasons you can't prove to anybody anything. Right. I can't prove to anybody that these the stories I tell are real, or you can only go by your own experience. Uh, but when I started getting accepting of them and just opening up to saying, okay, what do you have to say, based on fight or flight, you know, to me we're all energy, their energy, and the only decisions I feel I can make at this point in my life about what to do or how to how to act is based on fight or flight because yeah. there's too many uh, variables. My mind only has information from the past. So if something new and different happens, you know. So um, that's what I go by. But when I started, even like the hobo in the back alley, uh, if I was to see a, a hobo live, mm -hmm. somebody in the back that I had pictured as from movies, as up to no good, you know, needing money, going to accost me in the back, then I would be afraid of it. But right. because I'm just going on how I feel, I never felt any bad feelings from gotcha. him. And, but I started, when I communicated with him, I started getting a personality. And that's what's really convinced me because when you get to know these energies mm -hmm. and you feel their personality and their motives or whatever, then um, you just start liking them like you do everybody else. Right. And, but that was the clearest thing for me to to um, to not be afraid and not worry about it, and, right. and to prove to myself that yeah they all exist they they were all they all had their own thing. One of the things that's um, crucial for me to explain on my own belief system is it really came home to me uh, a few years ago when my sister younger sister died of a uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. It was a very fast in six months she went from being a mother and a housewife and a grandmother that went baseball games to being totally frozen solid. I mean, literally, her head frozen like this, her arms frozen, her legs frozen out, and the only thing that she could move was her eyes. Um, and I still, to this day, it was such an enlightening thing because you could go in that room and she couldn't talk to you, she couldn't verify anything, but her, her essence was there. Yeah. Her essence was there. There was no doubt who she was, and it wasn't based on her actions or her mm -hmm. what we what we think are so important. You know right. what yeah. you do to me, or what I do for you, or what you do for me. All all this kind of activity stuff we 
do in our social life. Um, it was just pure. And her grandchildren, who were under the age of seven, four of them under the age of seven, would come in that room and crawl up in her lap so they could see into her face to tell her they left her. I mean, they were not thrown off by how she looked or anything. Right. They, that was grandma. That was her, and they knew it. And so that was in real time, you might say, mm -hmm. in real time, what I'm experiencing with the, right. with the spirits as it does. Yeah. So, and thank you for asking. Yeah. This is I really appreciate yeah. being able to to do this. Sure. Get the get the good word out, right? <laughs> I'm sure I could go on forever. <laughs> thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.